Uh, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Philip Cam. I'm from HKIB. I'm the general manager for Institute Development. Uh, we're here at uh, Cyberport uh, for the FinTech Intercon 2021. Uh, our session today is talking about alternative data uh, in terms of SME financing. And we have a, a wide spectrum of guests here with, with us today on this panel. We have some banks, we have some third party vendors, we have some FinTech, we actually have some customers of banks. So, uh, I'll let each of the panelists introduce themselves and their company, and then and we'll get into the discussion, okay? I want to start with you, Johnny. Sure. Hello, uh, my name is Johnny. I'm from China Consortium Bank of Asia, so I look after the product innovation. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Jessica, and I'm one of the founding members of Plan2. Good afternoon, everyone. It's John from Hansen Bank Commercial Banking, so I look after cash management and all the digital innovation for the bank. Hi, uh, I'm Ivan. I'm the founder and CEO of FindOut, a health tech company based in Hong Kong. Okay, excellent. So we have an introductions out of the way. So let's, let's talk about the topic at hand, alternative data and SME financing. Um, as you know, with the advent of Open API initiative from the Hong Kong MA, we've seen a, a shift in, in the focus, a way, sort of away from retail banking and more increased activity towards the commercial side uh, on the SME banking sector. Um, obviously, there are a lot of benefits of Open API, and, and, and I'll let you talk a bit about what those benefits are. So maybe Johnny can start from the perspective of a bank. What are the benefits that you see from Open API? Okay, sure. Thank you, Philip. So maybe I can, you know, share some context about you know Open API because it's quite a broad topic, you know, uh, which was initiated by HKMA around two years ago. So we have four phases, and now it has already undergone for two phases. Phase one basically is to to allow the bank to share their product or more standard data to other third parties, you know, like your deposit rate, your exchange rate, your number of branches, and phase two is allowing the bank to work with some third party provider like TSP to allow the TSP to refer some new customer to the bank. So this is, I think this is the basic phase one and phase two are doing. So but now uh, we are moving on to the phase three, which is something a bit different than before because uh, it's uh, talking about to ask the bank to share the existing customer data, no matter it will be a retail customer or it can be also SME customer as well. So this is something that to the bank, you know, um, something very interesting because, you know, it's the first time the bank, you know, asking the bank to, to share their data to third parties, of course, with the consent from customer, either they be a retail customer or SME. So this is something that um, from the benefits from, from uh, you know, you can imagine the, the future model will be that, uh, so some banks, you know, if they are, if you, from a customer perspective, if you're a SME or a custom or a retail customer, you have multiple bank accounts in different banks. You have bank account in Hansen Bank, bank account in CCB. But in one day, you are allowed to, with your consent, you can, you know, select your favorite bank, banking partner, or maybe uh, some new product, you know, so that you can allow them to see the, the, date, the, the bank data across different banks, you know. So that means uh, you only need to log into one single mobile app, either you'll be HSBC, Hansen, or, or CCB, you can, but you are allowed to see the bank account in other banks. <laughs> so this is something to be very, you know, uh, to, a, to a bank is something that very different than before to mm. market, yeah. So that means uh, you, if, uh, you, can take, you can see the advantage of this, this trend or this framework, you can create some new product, uh, a new, you know, new customer experience for the, for the, for the client. No matter the client can be able to easily to plan their financial, from, to plan their saving or spending. For SME, they are, they, they are allowed to do a much robust, you know, holistic cash flow forecast, you know, across different bank accounts. Of course, you know, you can also allow some new fintech uh, company, you know, so they can provide some new service, you know, to aggregate or to consolidate those data into something more in meaningful and then to present to the, to the end user. So that's something that, for much beneficial uh, advantage or some, some good things for the bank that can be definitely some a new, new creation of business model or new services. So John, from a hand sign perspective, what are some of the challenges that you see at your bank with Open API? I uh, know you look at uh, Open API, the entire ecosystem, there will be um, quite a number of parties involved. Of course, the bankers, we have to play a role. The participating uh, corporate, whether it's SME or the microfinancing, they have to play a role. And also some third party provider, mm -hmm. like those FinTech company, they are being the collector, 
think the, the cloud funding service provider. And also very important, just like uh, what HKMA has been promoting, is to have a robust infrastructure. There should be a central infrastructure by which you have to allow a uh, very efficient usage of the data on a consented manner in an efficient way. So I, I, I think it's all the different participants, they have to play the different role in this entire ecosystem to be, to be, to work uh, very efficiently and to the benefit of each of the participating uh, organization in this ecosystem. You, you mentioned different perspectives. So I'd like to ask maybe Jessica, from your perspective as a potential customer, uh, a FinTech that's in this space, what, what, what's your impression of open APIs? Um, open API, I mean, in a, theoretically, I mean, it's, a, it's something that really makes sense. Um, it's something that's happening across the world. You see it being mandated in uh, the UK and the US is also pushing for it, Australia, Singapore, and even Taiwan. Um, so I think Open API is definitely something that benefits both the customers and potentially even more banks because it's a way for them to access um, even more data so that they're able to, let's say, provide a more personalized um, not only experience, but financial products for um, their customers as well. If you look at the typical um, SME customer or even end consumers in general, um, they're so accustomed to very personalized experiences from, let's say, just as simple as Spotify, Amazon, those kind of platforms. And banks have this opportunity with open banking to, to be able to do that. So um, we, because of this, and I guess because of Plan2 and, and, and our, our role in this space, um, as uh, we started off as a, a personal finance management platform, but now we're essentially a um, B2B provider where we work with banks on different, different initiatives, which includes PFM, BFM, and also API integration. So uh, we're really pushing for it too, and, and we really support this whole ecosystem. Are there any obstacles that you find that could be reduced? Uh, in terms of a vendor or? From, from your perspective, the implementation of Open right. API. Yeah, so uh, in Hong Kong's case, I guess the, the main challenge is how to, because it's not mandated in Hong Kong, um, the main challenge is to find the business value and use case, the concrete ones, where, in, where we can work with different banks to identify these opportunities mm -hmm. and set up these kind of bilateral um, agreements and, and work towards that. Um, but I think in general, uh, it's, it's been quite a good experience in a sense that the banks we've talked to so far are supportive of the initiative. So um, I think it's about working together and finding that, that value and efficiency. Mm. So Ivan, I mean, your company is not really a, a FinTech. I mean, it's a tech company, but not really a financial technology company. So from your perspective, what do you think of OpenAPI? Uh, I think for FindDoc, uh, as a doctor marketplace, we work uh, closely with, uh, with private clinics. So I think from the SME point of view, they definitely, I think they have been facing a lot of problems when they deal with uh, uh, payment settlement. Usually, uh, still right now, it's still 100% cash and check. So definitely, if there's uh, any kinds of like uh, API or solution that pr and provide to uh, so so as to create a better, uh, maybe a more transparent. Uh, credit line to them in the future could be uh, beneficial to the industry as well. Mm. Now, Johnny, I mean, in the past, you've been, you've been quoted as saying, you know, open API is not a compliance issue. It's really about innovation and mm. collaboration with other industry players. And, and, and that's really why we're here, to talk mm. a lot about the business opportunities and, and the collaboration. Maybe you can comment on, on what you said before. Sure, you know, you know, although the, the open API framework, you know, was initiated by HKMA, from extent from some extent it's something that the bank need to follow or need to be. But but in the meantime, if you change you just treat it as a compliance project or something that you just follow the, the MA's instruction, you might not be able to give you the ultimate benefits because you know, I think from the past experience in other regions like UK or Europe. So I think some of the bank they just treat it as a compliance project, just get the API ready and then but they didn't innovate themselves to leverage the, the chance to, to get the API, you know, to either from a consumer standpoint, from a data from a provider standpoint, I mean from a data standpoint, data consumer, data provider standpoint. So they, they might miss some opportunity to really to, you know, to innovate their, their product, uh, you know, or also to the end user customer experience. That's the ultimate goal is to make sure that they are able to enjoy the open API benefits. So I think the, the key, you know, maybe from my challenge you, you to when we're going to, you know, uh, of course, you know, from a security standpoint, open API is very important to make sure that it's robust, it has to be running, you know, safely, and then without any 
uh, some cybersecurity issue. But in the meantime, how are we going to justify the business case, you know, uh, you know, to make sure that all the party with the bank, you know, they are buying on, okay, let's create a new product, you know, say for example, just me mentioned by Jessica, a PFM, personal finance management, to, which allow me, uh, allow a customer, your, your, your customer to, to consolidate your, your bank account balance, either maybe a deposit balances, maybe a credit card balances across different banks. You know, that's something that even for SME, same, for BFM, business finance management, you can allow SME to consolidate all this data together. But that implies in investment. Because just getting, getting API ready is already one investment. But on top of that, to get the, the business case or the use case ready is also another uh, you know, challenge that we need to overcome. Mm -hmm. And as we mentioned by, by Jessica that, the, this is at the moment in in Hong Kong, unlike other countries like Singapore or, or or UK, this kind of mandatory. That means all the bank they are in this game. They have to allow them to share the data to the to the to the PS bank or even to fintech company. But in Hong Kong, we are still get the data ready first. And then we will talk to each bank bilaterally to agree when we can open the data. You know, to both sides. That's something that is interesting. Definitely, we we'll, we we'll, we will try to understand how we can move along with this journey. But uh, definitely, if you know, if some kind of alignment between different bank that okay, we're going to share. Let's do it. That will be much more easy for the bank to justify this. Because ultimately, if at the end, if the some of the bank they are not opening their data, only one only part of the bank are doing that. That will be kind of a difficult for for you to. Explain from the customer standpoint, they're not really able to see. Ah, hey, here, here you can see all your bank balances in you know, across different bank. Yeah, this is something that I want to, to share. Mm. And I guess from a, a risk perspective, how do you how do you manage that risk? That, because you're opening up your systems to other people, right? How do you manage that risk? Yeah, I, I just want to uh, echo what uh, Johnny just mentioned. Uh, surely, in my view, it isn't a compliance project. It should be a project which, uh, or initiative which try to change in the entire ecosystem and the industries as well. Uh, that should be commercial benefit to every participant in this initiative, whether you are a commercial bank, whether you are, you are the corporate who are going to uh, give away your data, your information to the, to the banker, or even the, the service structure or the infrastructure provider. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know whether it's HKMA or any of the service provider, but uh, surely each of the participants should be able to find some commercial value out there. Uh, from the risk perspective, um, I think the concept-wise, everyone will think that it's uh, very highly risky because your, your, your commercial data, your personal data is being openly shared uh, under your consent with the authorized uh, participant, whether it's a party provider or a banker. But I think uh, as long as we have got the proper risk modeling in place or the kind of uh, security infrastructure in place, I believe it's something which is uh, manageable. But the commercial or business value deriving out of this open API uh, infrastructure should be much, much more than, than the, the kind of investment required. Mm. So can you give us some examples of the business opportunities that you see? You mentioned personal financing. Are there other opportunities out there? Yeah, I came from commercial banking, so, so I guess uh, it's also related to the topic of today's panel. It's about alternate credit scoring. Because we, as long as we have got more uh, data from the, from the customer, uh, from the commercial customer, whether it's the transactional data or non transactional data, all this will form the kind of uh, credit decision engine of a commercial bank. Uh, I think from the banking perspective, we also welcome this because it will be more cost efficient. Uh, imagine if you are positing a, a, a SME loan, the same account, amount of effort, but the, the, kind of, uh, the quantum or the amount of the loan sum will be much smaller than a large, large loan. But uh, so banker, we have to also to find a way how to process or apply or evaluate a loan credit application in a more efficient way. So I think this is the correct direction that we all have to head into. So as a, I guess as a, a borrower, let's look at it from a borrower's perspective. Having open API allows you to get access to more funding, correct? How does that benefit you? I mean, that ease of getting funding uh, and the provision of data in exchange to get that funding. Well, can you explain a little bit more uh, of the benefit from, your, from a borrower's perspective? Right, 
uh, I'll, I'll take this question then. Yeah. Um, so from an SME's perspective, so actually the spirit of CDI essentially is to give opportunities to um, small medium enterprises to have access to loans. Um, the idea here is that because usually these small medium enterprises, they probably don't have a lot of track record mm -hmm. um, because the traditional method of credit scoring is using, let's say, your um, audited financial statements, management accounts to actually determine, okay, do these certain financial ratio ratios um, meet the benchmark for you to get access to loans? But a lot of these like startups, I mean, we've been around for around three years now, but let's say companies that's just been um, uh, working for around less than one year, they don't have this data to give to banks um, mm -hmm. to actually process it. And so CDI comes in handy for these type of companies because they essentially can use alternative data. Um, so for example, they can use the, uh, the SME's transaction data or let's say e-commerce data to actually show to the bank that, okay, yeah, I don't have management accounts or audited accounts to give you um, because I've just been operating for less than one year. But right. I do have proof to show that I have the cash flow or the order details or um, transactions that show to you that I'm financially strong. Sorry, just for the benefit of our audience, what do you mean by CDI? Oh, CDI is commercial data interchange. So this is basically one of the um, initiatives that HKME is pushing out um, to actually, you know, give more uh, what they call small medium enterprises um, opportunities to get access to loans from banks. So, um, so yeah, so, so basically this essentially getting this alternative data um, is very beneficial um, and um, that's why, you know, uh, HKMI is pushing it more. Okay. And, and, you know, I'll let the other panelists elaborate yeah. as well. Yeah, maybe I can also try to supplement, you know, what is CDR because, you know, our uh, management also are the same, you know, you have open API and now you're talking to me, CDI, they're, they're, are they similar or they are the same, you know. So I think open API we talked about already, but for CDI, uh, I think the difference is that, you know, the, the two is that open API is that you, are, you, are, you can be both a, a bank and both a data consumer or data provider. That means uh, you, need, you can consume some data from other bank or from other parties. You need to also need to provide data to some other bank if you bilaterally agree the, the term. For CDI, it seems to be uh, easier, easier to understand. It's more for the bank to consume some alternate data from other provider. It can be a telco provider. It can be an e-commerce provider. It can be any, it can be a, maybe a, a trade organization that provides you some import export figures as well. So all these data you can consume for you to determine uh, the credit scoring, the KYC, you know, that, you know, for you to beyond those, uh, you know, uh, traditional data that you obtain a financial report, your, you know, your, your ID proof, whatever, something, something beyond that. This is something the, so I think to a bank, you know, when you explain to the management, or oh, oh, that I'm more relaxed, you know, just to get more data. I think it's fine. You know, I think you, you just try to explore as more as use ca more use case as possible because that will be helping the bank to, you know, maybe shifting from more traditional credit model to a to a new uh, way of, you know, assessing the, the credit profile of the uh, except, except for the SME customers. Yeah. And I mean, this this data. Maybe you can explain what kind of data are we talking about when you talk about. Alternative data. What exactly do you mean? Uh, you talk about from uh, CDI perspective, as what well, Johnny mentioned, um, for a company to operate, they have they got their financial data, they have got their cash flow, their their sales, their their uh, um, stock, and um, also there are some sort of long financial data as well, by which mm. is like the company ownership, your 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 buyer, your supplier relationship. So uh, the bank they will make use of that that set of data uh, by using machine learning and with some of the AI that we have applied into that particular modeling in order to derive a credit scoring for a particular customer. And I think the beauty of using that is also the uh, it will be very dynamic. Unlike the traditional credit credit uh, scoring mechanism, by which you are using the, the mm. historic balance sheet, his, the historic PNL, but if you are using the dynamic uh, sales data, it can be very timely. It can be updated very timely, and the request can be submitted to the bank easily. And the bank's credit decision making process can be much speeder, 
uh, much speed up than, than before. So I guess it, it, it's trying to make the entire uh, process to be more efficient in a, in a more secure way as well, because the bank will allow using all the live data, all the latest information from a particular corporate in order to assess the credit scoring or the credit um, uh, um, um, situation of that particular uh, client. So I think uh, it's a, uh, the direction that um, the entire industry, no matter you are a bank or you are a corporate, they, uh, they should be heading towards, they should be heading for. Yeah, that brings us to Ivan and, and, and Fine Doc. And, and obviously, you have a lot of data. Um, you know, maybe you can describe a little bit about the data that you have and, and how you utilize that to get financing. Sure. So I think it also applies to the medical industry as well. Uh, for find out, we uh, develop a doctor marketplace connecting patients with doctors through uh, our platform. And one of our mission is always to uh, empower the private clinic. As you, uh, you can imagine, in Hong Kong, usually a clinic involves maybe a doctor and two nurses. So they don't have like, any IT or marketing uh, support at all. So one of the key issues we, we see is uh, in the uh, B2B payment sector, there's a 100% uh, untapped market there where uh, when doctors they order drugs from the pharmaceutical companies, they are still uh, settling the payment and also do all the things manually and uh, the payment are 100% uh, in cash and check. So one of the uh, solutions that we are developing together with our domestic bank is to, uh, to develop like an e-commerce like experience for private doctors to uh, order drugs and also to pay uh, settle payment electronically at the same time. So one of the, uh, uh, the alternative data uh, we're generating in the future is uh, transactional data. And I think this is very important to uh, private clinics as well, so as to have a more transparent credit line in the future to manage their cash flow better at the same time. So this is one of the things we are very excited uh, to work closely with a leading uh, domestic bank in Hong Kong. So, okay, and then once you get the data to the bank, how does the bank then use that for your credit scoring? Maybe you can explain a little bit more on, on the credit scoring aspects of it. Yeah, the bank has to design your own credit uh, scoring model. I think this model will be comprising uh, the usage of the proper amount, and uh, the amount which I mean is the quality, the quantity of the data that you have on hand, and also uh, with the the uh, the, um, the different duration as well, because you observe, observe a few months data compared to 12 months, compared to 18 months, will be very different. And um, the bank, once you create this model, you have to uh, continue to uh, fine tune it, because uh, nobody can predict that uh, this model will be ideal for the next next uh, two years. It can be something which the bank also has to experiment. Well, of course, uh, as a bank, uh, we can control the risk by, by, for example, you can limit the, the loan size, the amount of the loan and the offer period uh, to, to have a more very dynamic modeling. I think that is very, very important compared mm. with the traditional credit mindset that we have. And then from, from Planto's perspective, there's alternative data that, I mean, I guess the type of data that Ivan's talking about is maybe different than the type data that you would be uh, talking about? Is that, is that fair to say or not? Um, I guess just taking a step back, maybe um, uh, apart from the data part, how Planto gets involved, let's say, because obviously open banking and CDI, they have their um, overlaps, um, but they also have their differences. So for CDI um, specifically, the whole initiative. So where we come in is um, if you look at the bank's journey towards CDI, uh, like the whole initiative, there's essentially four main steps. So first step is um, they need to get customer consent. So how does a bank actually incentivize these SMEs um, to actually give them their data? Why should an SME give them their order data? Why should I give them my cash flow data from other banks as an example? Um, second one is API integration. Um, obviously open banking is API involved as well, but CDI is also API involved. How does a bank ensure that the API integration with an external party is smooth mm. and works well? And third is the data part. So even if you get the data, it's not going to be, um, it's going to be unstructured. Uh, how do you ensure that it's standardized for the bank? And then last is the business value part where how do you create a credit score model or alternative applications once you get these um, alternative data? So where Planto comes in is um, we touch upon um, a bit of like that progress of process of actually um, helping banks to go to market faster. So from the consent part, you know, how do we help banks actually incentivize their customers to give them data? So it's like what Johnny mentioned, BFM. 
business financial management. We offer or we help banks build up these financial management features so that it's a value added service so that customers can use it and essentially integrate, let's say, e-commerce data or uh, other third party data into this platform so that they're able to use it and the bank will also get real time data as well. So it's not just, okay, I want a loan, I'll get you, um, I want you, you process my data. It's continuous. Mm. So um, the second part is API testing. So as a third party, um, banks can test with us to ensure that let's say the APIs work well. That's really important because if it doesn't work well, then you can't really get that data, right? Um, third, the data part is we, because of our experience as a um, application before, we have experience in getting that data and then standardizing it and essentially building insights around that. And fourth is essentially um, the end business value side where uh, essentially we, like linking it to BFM is build that insights that these banks need in order to, let's say, make certain decisions, whether that be lending or other products as well. Mm. So is it fair to say that the banks have to then clean their own data or is that done for them? So we actually can clean the data for them. Okay. Um, it's because uh, we have experience in aggregating um, data from different banks in Hong Kong. So we've already have that experience of cleansing that as well. Okay. And then once it gets to the bank, I mean, I mean banks have a, an issue with having data coming from multiple sources yeah. or having the same data or having conflicting data. I mean, maybe from a bank's perspective, how do you address those types of issues with, with clean data? Johnny. Okay, yeah, I think from uh, getting the data or those alternate data, I think we definitely will take a step-by-step step step approach. You know, we won't be starting, you know, getting multiple data source, you know, at the, at, at the day one, because uh, for example, you know, our bank is ex ex experiencing, you know, from a CDI standpoint, we would like to see, to add, get some simple data. You know, for example, uh, as you mentioned, what are the data sources? Uh, uh, give an example, like telco company. So they have most of the, basically all, the, all your, your customers address proof because you know, they, you, you have installed the broadband in, in the, all the telco facility in some of your, your existing client or new client. So one, one thing you can consider is that we will try to maybe get the address proof, you know, because when you apply for uh, either a, a personal bank account or a retail or corporate bank account, you need to provide some address proof. Here is your business registered office or whatever. So maybe you can just ask the customer to give a consent. Let me just get the address proof, you know, from from either from the existing you know telco provider, you know, so there are only a few in Hong Kong, right? So they get those data, and then you can and reach the customer. Okay, this is your okay. I just confirm this is your your address. You know, this is from a, more from a KYC standpoint. Mm -hmm. So we will start with this as, as step one, uh, because that is of course from a, from a customer experience standpoint, that can also be some kind of improvement because you know in the future you might not need to provide your address proof. You can just Give, give me my, my consent, and because as like I mentioned, how do you persuade the customer to give the consent? You know, there must be some advantage to that. You, I will not share my data with, with no reason, with no benefit to me, right? So if I can eliminate some step, some fiction, you know, during the uh, process, then I will be more happy to do that. So this one thing from a, a customer, experience, customer experience improvement. And of course, the, for stage two, we will be moving, maybe ho hopefully can build our own model for uh, for you know, for uh, credit scoring, because you know, I think definitely we're talking about financial inclusion, uh, and also for those uh, SME customers, it's, it's basic to most of banks is a blue ocean because you know uh, they are kind of underserved in some extent because they might be getting a loan from one million to three million Hong Kong Hong Kong dollar, right? So it's, you know, but our corporate customer, they usually multi million customer, also most of them are secure loan as well. So how do we move in from those uh, those this blue ocean that may be more underserved? You know, of course, with the help from customer, have some guarantee on the uh, you know a guarantee on on the loan size. That I think the bank are more open, you know, to develop some model. You know, leveraging some fintech companies assistance to to help us to uh, you know to develop a robust model for them to. Of course, it has been it has been unmanded because you can't have your credit team to approve you know you know hundred loan per day for some SME with that size. So definitely, that's something that uh, we'll take a step by step approach. So we don't we are not too worried about mixing the, the data, but I think mean, I think we are more about concern whether we can build a robust uh, credit model as also is proven. Because at the end of the day, building model is is as you mentioned by John, building model is is uh, is. You can do it, but you have to predict the model. Also, make sure that the, the model performs well. You, you, at the end of the day, you rely on the model to give.
give you all the credit assessment. What about fairness? John, you also mentioned about uh, the convenience to the customer perspective. I think it's also very important. You have to make sure this process is seamless because imagine if you are uh, SM, you are operating a restaurant, for example. Yeah. I'm doing my part of sales every day. I'm doing my sales. I'm selling my, my goods every day. But in, in the past or in the current world, that uh, you have to provide all the financial pool, financial statement to the bank. But in the future, if you can make the best use of this set of data, which you are already operating on a daily basis, and seamlessly, you are able, with your consent, you are able to pass to the bank. Then the bank will use the machine to, to credit, to assess the credit. I think this will be the, the model which um, I think I would, I would say that you will be welcomed by the corporate side. Mm. So from an SME perspective, Ivan, has this uh, concept really helped you to spend less time in front of your banker and just give them the data here, you take it? And um, I think uh, uh, not only for find out, I think for doctors as well. I think one of the key challenges would be uh, we need to educate them. Even though if we have a very good uh, user experience product, a solution uh, developed from the open API or uh, uh, similar solutions, I think the, the difficult part would be uh, to educate uh, a, a industry already developed for uh, so many years, but they are still doing cash and check because uh, maybe to some of them they are st uh, still very resourceful, so they uh, they don't have a urgency to change, but they do need some time to educate them and let them to have a certain period of time of experience, so that once they enjoy the whole experience, then they will they cannot get back to the previous version. So mm -hmm. I think education is very important to the market as well. I mean, how do you how do you educate um, you know a, a segment of the population that is so used to having you know physical money still using checks in this day and age? How do you educate? I think myself we just talked about it before we come to this room. I think we need pioneer in each of the industry. We need to have some pioneer who are able to drive change, who believe change. I think once we because what we observe in the market is whenever there's someone who moves faster then the other will follow. So I, I think that the good tactics is to have some pioneer or some, some pilot in uh, some uh, selected industries, then the entire industry will be moving very fast. Mm. Uh, I see Jessica nodding. Do you have anything to add to those comments on? I guess um, this touches upon how do you encourage different industries to digitalize? Yeah. And I think, uh, I think an example is is if you look at I mean it's it's like like uh, John also mentioned is that um, you need to have a pioneer whether it's a player in the market or even the government I'll give you an indirect example is um, the consumption voucher mm -hmm. um, because of the consumption voucher actually the adoption of let's say octopus in different um, merchants. Um, you know, from different merchants, it has you know increased by a lot because people realize this is important and incentivizes people to go digital. Same with people accepting, let's say, WeChat Pay or um, AliPay as well. So I think it's things like these, um, just kind of doesn't uh, changes people's behavior, but in a sense, it taps into, let's say, um, the psychology of how people kind of react to things, and I think that's kind of important. Like the the importance, the fundamental fundamental importance here is actually to understand the customer. And then from that, build that ecosystem or build that kind of pioneering uh, initiatives to, to push towards digitalization. So what about the typical Hong Kong customer? How would you describe them in terms of their acceptance of providing alternative data and, and dealing with banks in a different way? What, what's your opinion on, on that state, John? I mean, uh, the, the interaction with the different industries, in fact, uh, it's, it's quite traditional, in fact, yeah, by, from my observation. But I guess there are also some group of, uh, uh, of customers who are very willing to change. But I guess they also need something to, 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 to help them, like the technology, like your, your bank uh, or the, the other ecosystem, mm. in to allow them to change. So I, I guess, again, um, there are always different types of customers, but some of them, they're very willing to change, as long as the, the entire ecosystem can help them. So doctors, let's say, very well-educated group of, of consumers, 
how would doctors accept something like this? Yeah, I think like to doctors, they are also a SME owner. So as a business owner, uh, I think incentive is very important as well. So I think it's always go back to uh, they are very incentive driven. So that's why I think when we are doing the study uh, uh, to develop the B2B payment solution, one of the, uh, we need to study all the value uh, stakeholders which in the value chain, including not only doctors and also the pharmaceutical companies. So we always go back to them and to see if we can develop different type of incentive schemes uh, to actually to uh, drive the doctors to participate in a new solution as to build a behavior later on. So I think incentive is also very important to, to end users. Mm. I guess uh, we have some time for some Q&A. And uh, you know, the, I guess the audience really wants to know is uh, banks are not mandated to do this. They are highly recommended that they do this. I mean, maybe some of the, the key challenges from a bank's perspective. John. Yeah, I think uh, as we mentioned briefly about you know either CDI or Open API, I think you know that required you know some innovation that some require some you know to study of the entire ecosystem as well. So uh, so I think the the challenges is you know whether we can really uh, you know setting aside all the security IT stuff you know, but beyond that you know. Uh, how to really, you know, get a business case, you know, uh, on some of the, you know, because that requires some investment, require maybe not immediate return as well. Maybe it will take them some time, some education, some kind of customer behavioral change. So all these things, or maybe wait, wait for some, something happen like the cash voucher, for example, maybe one day you will be changing, but, but it will take some time, you know. So how, how do we, uh, and in the, on, on the other hand, you know, beside the business case, how do we have enough support from, uh, uh, from fintech perspective, you know, do is this this kind of uh, innovation is typical in your bank or, or or not? If not, how do you really you know build a team or to f collaborate with some other fintech partners, you know, to to work on those uh, this kind of uh, initiative? Of course, you know, you, you can do a good POC. Uh, you can you know present to your management team that hey, this is the the future model for either CDI or Open API in terms of you know the customer experience standpoint. At the end of the day, we're talking about customer experience. Is the customer really enjoying your services? Enjoying the is something something differentiated from before. So I think this uh, getting business case and also getting some fin some fintech solution, robust solution to do some POC that is able to. Uh, lay down the journey in a much safer way because we can't really get a, a huge amount of money, you know, with, on day one, you know, to because it's still a kind of a an export market or to the bank. Maybe not in in other country, maybe in other region, maybe, but in Hong Kong, we are still experiencing, and we don't know. At the end, of one day that will be happening, but you know how fast we don't know, and how any something something uh, some special circumstances will happen as well. So I think that's something that we need to. Uh, do a robust business case and also do some uh, very you know, well-justified POC as well. Mm. Okay, I guess we have time for one more question uh, from uh, a third-party vendor perspective and, and fintech and, and how this impacts um, the banking industry and especially on the use of data uh, and, and also fairness, you know, because you are rating somebody on a non-traditional way using non-traditional data. Maybe you can just talk a quick a bit about the fairness aspect of it. Um, the fairness part of it, I, I guess, I mean, I mean, that is just taking a step back then, that would just be um, saying that it's fair because let's say, uh, actually the whole CDI initiative is fair because it's giving more SMEs this opportunity to get access to loans mm. which they wouldn't have and to grow further. And because it's consent based, um, then in that sense, Fundamentally, it, you have that fairness there, where it, it, it really depends. The, the power is on the SME side. You control side. it. You, you control, control your data. it, basically. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Any any, any closing sure. comments before we uh, sign off? I think if I'm working with uh, people like Jessica or Ivan, I'm sure they have to be fully compliant as well. <laughs> but I think um, I, I I think it's very important to ensure we treat the customer fairly. We have to uh, share out clearly the benefits of any solution to them, but equally. We have to also tell them what the limitation, what the drawbacks. I think that is, uh, that is in order to cultivate a very long-term relationship with the customer. So uh, for any fintech partner working with us, we have to uh, equally observe the same principle. 
Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you all for, for joining us today. Hopefully you thank guys you. got benefit from their uh, extensive knowledge. So thank you once again.